one and all, and welcome back to another 25 North Presents Mutiny, the show where we talk about nothing and everything all at the same time. Today, I am with a joyous group of strangers. Just kidding, it's it's people you know fairly well and a special guest. Tonight, we have Rachel. We have our very special new first time first time mutiny guest, Jackson. Hello! And coming all the way from the distant shores of Kanto, we have a special guest joining us from the TRT podcast. A very special person to yours truly, Robin. Hi, it's me. Tonight, we're going to take you through a joyous adventure of various topics, mostly tying down to the topic of improvisation and how to use it best. And how you enjoy doing it. I think everybody kind of has their own style when it comes to things like improv and every show fuels it in a different way. It's unfortunate we don't have Lunar joining us tonight because it's always interesting seeing the extra chaotic side of things rear its head. But does anybody have any particular stories they want to start off with before we get into improv? I can talk for a while, so. Uh, I've had to improvise an entire dungeon one time. (laughs) Okay. What led you to the event that caused you to improvise a full dungeon? So, it's definitely partially my fault. Uh, I was running a Yonti campaign back when I was, like, first starting to get into D&D and, like, learning the rules. This is one of the very first games I ever run. But I went to... They they were at a village. It was getting attacked by a lot of uh, Yanti people that were coming from a place that is... Uh, that was like a few miles away from the village itself. So they went there and saw that it was crawling with abominations and malisons and all sorts of like really, really dangerous uh, Yanti. So they decided to pick up and run back to the village... On the way back, I had them discover this, like, witch's house of someone who kind of understood what was going on in the region. I can't remember the exact specifics of it. It was so long ago. But after they visited them, I thought they were going to keep going to the town. And instead, they turned around and went right back to the danger zone. So I had to improvise that entire setting with the pyramid and, like, what was inside the Yanti pyramid completely off cuff off rip it was very stressful (laughs) yeah i think some of those high stress moments are also some of the most memorable over time Mm -hmm. i'm a big fan of and you guys can correct me on your personal thoughts here actually before i get into my story i'll ask a question do you find it easier to improv in homebrew or on something pre-written or do you not find much difference oh absolutely homebrew yeah, I'd agree. Then you don't have to worry about messing up some plot point that's later in the AP. Because you can just change the general storyline to what you want. Which, I mean, you can do with pre-written, but easier. It's a, a little bit more convoluted. And how about our special guest? I know that you guys run in a fairly homebrewed universe on both of your shows. Both your standard oh, yeah, public one and your Patreon Legend of Zelda show. Do you find it easier to improv to your heart's content knowing that you're kind of in a morphable universe that's working around you rather than some of our Pathfinder experiences? Like, we play strange aeons together. You've been in that game for much longer than I have, but your character Niobe is quite interesting and different than what most people encounter. (laughs) Yeah. Do you find it difficult to roleplay as Niobe? No, not at all. No. So for a little... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, she's kind of homebrewed herself. Uh, even though we're playing in an AP, I, Alex let me ditch all of the AP bonus feats. And he gave me bonus feats that I asked for just as flavor, honestly. Because yeah, she's so- like half snake. So I asked for Swallow Hole for fun. Uh <laughs> the yeah. best when the GM is willing to work with you to make what you want instead of what the rules say you can have. Oh, yeah. Well, and Absolutely. I think that flexibility is important. 
and can add up to some very memorable and interesting characters and interactions between characters. We all know that I have a long-running history of characters dying quite abruptly from insignificant, minor, silly little things, whether it's trying to combat roll through a troll's legs in Jade Regent, or trying to talk a shadowless drake down in a small cave. My characters reach pretty swift ends, so I'm constantly forced to reevaluate how to roleplay new characters, and I know all of us run games. Do you find that the variation of NPCs or even player characters you play in your downtime uh, leads to any strain, or you worry about playing that same character over and over without deviation? A loaded question, I know. I struggle with this in my own head, and that's why you end up with such distinctly different characters, because I try and go very different routes in concept. Rizurk was, you know, he was, he was Rizurk. Valmo didn't really get to see much of the light of day and really spread their wings. And we've recently met Zaba, um, who, you know, he's not such a bad guy. But each of them are very different, and it's been a struggle at times to make sure to keep Zaba separate from Rizurk. Is that something you guys run into? Is that easier to think about? It's it's certainly a challenge just trying to keep character straight and character motivations different because there will be situations where like I have uh, a warlock named Kendall and I have to remind myself whenever I'm not playing Kendall that this character is not going to make the same decisions that Kendall would make because they just have an entirely different upbringing, they have different goals, they have different purposes and so I have to like go through and basically get myself into the headspace of that character so that way when I'm thinking about how I'm making my decisions, I'm thinking through the lens of that specific character like Vesuviac or it, just to prevent me from going into Kendall, which is my longest running D&D character that you know I'm very comfortable in his skin. So uh, there certainly is a challenge to that. Yeah. Are you... Uh finding Vesuviac to become more comfortable with time? Or Absolutely. are you still kind of ironing out some of that? Who is this character? There is a little bit of, like, who is this character? Like, what are his motivations? What are his goals? There still is a small bit of that going on right now, but at the same time, Vesuviac himself is also figuring that out on his own. So just kind of the, the way that I try and slip into that skin and make sure that I'm really working as Vesuviac is just like, I know his past. How is he thinking things are going down? Like, does this serve his assumed goal that he has? Or is it something that may go against it? Does it go against his God? And uh, those decisions making process with Kendall is a lot more like, does this continue my cover with the party as I'm secretly working with a bad guy? Does this uh, put any suspicion on myself? Is this something that still makes the party progress but could cause inter-party conflict? Uh, so it's a completely different lens and completely different scope that I have to get into. But yeah, as time goes on, it does get much easier to slip in and out of those modes. Fair. <clears throat> Super fair. Uh, Rachel... I think you've been at this probably longer than the rest of us. Yeah. And with that, you've decades. probably been through, you know, the most characters and the most NPCs and whatnot. How does that play out for you after all, all the experiences? Yeah. I mean, I try to, I'm trying to think of answers to your questions. I feel like I, I pretty much just slip into a character's mindset and then I'm that character. The thing that really trips me up is when I make comments out of character and people don't realize that they're out of character and then all my characters will start. I did this last night. I was playing uh, the last night. Uh, made a comment, sarcastic comment, out of character. People did not realize and it was like, ooh, that's uh, unfortunate. But as far as actually staying in character, I, I don't know. I can't 
speak to any tips or tricks, unfortunately. It's just kind of a a natural thing, I guess. You just um, do it. I just do it. The, hey, the out of character comments are why I adopt the character voice. <laughs> I was going to ask, does that help you, Corey, too, to keep your character yeah. straight? So I have like a psychopath version of character creation. I kind of, <laughs> I think I talked about it at the start of of the podcast on how Rizzerk was developed at first in my shower, and then he was moved into the business that I ran. And I talked as him to every employee I had for the better part of a week and got in his skin, <laughs> got used to the voice. And that's why I can slip into him without even thinking about it. He's just there. I am Rizzer. I'm a, I'm a dragon. I'm a scavenger. Give me stuff, you know. And through that process, you really you talk like him. You try and company uh, embody it uh, you'll notice quite often when i record as zaba i get up and i stretch several times throughout the recording because Corey is five seven but Z- zaba is like 11 foot eight so you know i gotta stretch i gotta make myself feel big so that i can try and get into that mindset a little bit better so maybe it's like method acting for me i I just, uh, I figure out where this person's core motiv- motivations are and how that has caused them to go from point A to point B and where they are now in that tra- uh, trajectory from point B to point C. Because I like to think all, all characters, or not all, most characters don't start at the beginning of their story. They start, you know, a few years into it. They've been struggling or not. But I think an exception maybe our special guest character Stella let's talk about Stella I've got some insights because we talk but you've been playing Stella for over a year now correct Uh uh-huh yeah how do you get into Stella how did Stella come together so we kind of do Q&A's after like each arc we record and I actually answered this in one of the Q&As for our podcast. Um, Stella, all my characters for TTRPGs are little aspects of my own personality. I play myself in every character I play. Whether it's the, you know, silly weird snake lady that's, I believe, chaotic evil in our Strange Aeons game, or Stella, who was just this quiet girl with a super traumatic past and a determination to save everyone. They're all little aspects of my personality. Stella is my therapy. (laughs) I impose a lot of trauma on this character in her backstory, but also a lot of the turmoils she goes through is how she wants to find the secret third way to save everyone. They're do- like she doesn't want everything to be black and white. She has to, you know, rescue as many people as possible and if through that means she destroys herself. Hi, that's exactly what I do. <laughs> so, yeah, she's she's kind of my little trauma therapy child. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I think there's a level of uh, self-personification in all characters. It's just interesting to see where they come from. I can't remember if I've talked about it before, but a lot of my characters that I've played in the past come from certain emotions I was feeling at the time. Mm -hmm. Eileen was... uh, I was in a very inquisitive mood. That's my alchemist that I play and have been playing for a couple of years. I've moved her from one campaign to another. She, She makes lotions where the character who followed Eileen oh jeez can't even remember the oh Suki Suki was an oracle that uh, lived for a short while before they met their untimely demise to some wolves Um, but Suki was a very lonely character and that was at a time where I was struggling with my loneliness so I think that a lot can be said for characters um, helping you work through different things but how does that make you feel when that character dies? What would happen if Stella were to swiftly perish and you no longer had that outlet? Well, I can't talk to you about that. 
All right, that's because fair. Because it, it, it hasn't happened, but it may it very could. well happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe we'll talk about it at that time. We'll see how many more characters I chew through before <laughs> that happens. But um, I do know not when I many. lose a long-term character that I've invested a lot of emotion in. Um, because I do that. I become my characters and I give them little aspects of things. And even even like Stella, I kind of... I was, I was into her character, but I didn't really flesh her out. I left a lot of things blank. Because I told Adam when we were creating them, I was like, these are the key points I want in her backstory. Everything else surprised me. Because I don't want to know everything about my character. Sometime, sometimes I want to come across things that I can interpret in a way that places something strange into their backstory. Or, you know, well, this is my reaction to this situation. That's a new quirk that we've just learned about my character. And this is why she's always had this quirk. So sometimes it just adds into me having more things to do with my character. But the more I play them and the more... I put into them the more I try to keep them alive to the best of my ability because I don't know I just become so emotionally attached to them like I created this brainchild it is part of me and without it I'm going to feel like a piece of me is gone I keep every character sheet of every character I've ever played in any game (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I've got a character sheet from when I was 10, so... Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I've I've never done a physical character sheet. so That's right, you've online, only played online. I, I've, I've only ever played online. I've never had a permanent character death. Oh, wow. Well, I can't say that. I've, I've had a couple <laughs> character deaths as well. <laughs> Uh, I think it's part of it. I'm sure you've had a few as well, Rachel. No. I've had no one character die, and it was... I mean, I've told this story before. My It was a character I'd only played, like, twice. I said, I'm standing outside the door. The GM picked up my mini, put it inside, said, you're standing here. And because I'm me, and I don't like, you know, to be confrontational, I just kind of shrugged. And then he breathed fire on them, and he died. Okay. So, yeah. I don't count it as a true character death because it was pretty BS. Yeah, but, that's uh, fair. You know, that's fair. that's fair. It did happen. I have not, did not play with them again. Um, I'm pretty sure the high crit justices would rule in your favor if you took this to D&D court. <laughs> I did have a character death when we played Jade Regent. But immediately, Corey's character, Eileen resurrected me using a little like magic box I think she had or something yeah there's a special artifact in Jade Regent that gives you the ability to uh, resurrect once every I think 30 days if I remember correct I can't remember but you immediately burned that on me and then was just like the troll the troll legs you were just like well I'm gonna do something stupid immediately dies yeah, that was and, a, cr- a crit <laughs> fail into a crit hit that resulted in an immediate character <laughs> death from full health. Thank you, massive, thank you, massive damage rules and one e. But because Eileen used that box to save Saris, I we'd ha- we'd had all these opportunities to like buy magic items or like whatever. I hadn't bought anything in a while, so I had like thousands and thousands of gold. So I saved all my money, and I I made our barbarian carry Eileen's body all the way back to town after we finished that area, and I resurrected her nice. in the, the temple. The escape from the dungeon we were crawling through, I think, took about five hours of me being carried back to town and fighting <laughs> through enemies. <laughs> I, I got up and I made supper. I uh, I was like an hour late for the next session because I knew <laughs> I was still dead. Like, yeah, it was quite a thing. But yeah, the the financial values you you earn in first edition Pathfinder are something special comparatively to I think any other system I've encountered. Do you guys know any other systems that you make bank? 
I mean, 5e, in my opinion, has a problem where you make a ton of money and know where to spend it. Yeah, 5e's big issue I found with items is there is no true item cost. Where we can go and look up a longsword plus one for Pathfinder, and there's a price tag on it. That could be a lot more mysterious when it comes to Dungeons and Dragons, in my experience at least. What the hell's a wondrous item? <laughs> there's Slotless. pretty explicit prices in first edition AD and D, but Yeah, we'd have to go back to first edition. I've never played it. D and D or Pathfinder? first edition ad and t okay yeah yeah i have the rule book behind me somewhere i think that's it's most that or the dungeon master's guide i i think i have it on my shelf as well i have a bookshelf right there completely <laughs> covered in shit <laughs> well and i i know jackson's been picking up some books recently here I yes have. i just Get got them books I got the uh, the three main books for Pathfinder. I've got the core rule book. I got the GM guide, and I've got a bestiary. So I Off have to a running start. I have all of the materials required to create a wonderful concoction of a campaign <laughs> or a disaster of a campaign, whichever one happens first. No such thing. As long as people <laughs> have fun, that's all that matters. Just don't put any minis inside a room and kill them with dragon breath. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a don't move. Big, that's a pretty minis. big faux pas. Let, let them move them. Uh, I do yeah. know, I've heard a story from my dad that they once got too much loot in first ed, AD&D, and the GM improvised by setting up a scenario in which the only way to survive was to lose all of their magic gear. Um, I don't remember the specifics, it's been a while, but uh, some trap or monster or something that they had to throw all of their shit at so that he could reset and get them back to where they should be. There's a so. deck of many things card that does that too. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Oh, that's a good story. I was playing my brother-in-law and father. I was GMing through Ravenloft and they found a deck of many things that I don't remember if I put it there or if it's in the module and drew one granted a wish, wish, and uh, the character decided he wanted to go home, which was a problem because in our version they were in a different dimension, so they had to teleport to an entirely new world that I then got to make up on the spot, so it was good times. Yeah. Yeah. So when you encounter a situation like that do you just go okay it's the same world just slightly different oh, or no. do you just throw something brand new no i made up a whole new world that was a um binary star system with a planet doing a figure eight so i had to figure out the seasons and the regions and all the rules for the extreme temperature fluctuations so no not the same world new world okay wow that's yeah that's cool. intense yeah, <laughs> geez, that's a lot. That's a really cool concept, though. Of playing Teach them to use a wish, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Sons. Right? Teach yourself to let them have a wish, I guess. It was fun <laughs> to create. We only got to play it for like a month, and then, uh, you know, it died. The campaign Life died, happens. So, yeah. 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 It's, it's rarely well, ever the big the bad evil tragedy. guy that kills the party. It's just scheduling conflicts. It is, honestly. It is. Even now, we find ourselves lunar free due to a scheduling conflict. Which is totally homophobic. Oh, come on, Lunar. How dare you? No, come on, her <laughs> family. Like, <laughs> y'all are totally homophobic a, to take her away from us like this. And how I dare, dare you do a public event on you. a Saturday night? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's always interesting seeing where players take games in weird directions and how GMs handle it. My world that I run somewhat regularly and it's been slow recently, I spent dozens and dozens of hours writing the whole universe, this whole island chain, geography, cave locations, perception checks, all of that, and I just generally let my players run wild in it. But I have over prepped to the degree that anything they stumble across, I can run it at high level or mid to low level. And I think that's a level of over preparedness that sometimes diminishes a game's quality. 
I haven't run into too many issues because I'm crazy and I'm good at handling seven pages open on three screens while also talking to people. But that is not an exaggeration. I've seen it. <laughs> Jesus Witnessed Christ, this dude. and it's madness. <laughs> I, I have six feet of monitors side to side, True. and I use I just, all three of them. I just got a third monitor, and it's vertical. <laughs> oh, no. I, I live a sweet horizontal life. I want another 34-inch widescreen to mount on top of my existing one on a downward angle so that I have the full plane of view. No, I need I need my webcam there. I, I had to, Part of the reason why I was a little bit late to the recording is because I was frantically trying to figure out how to not get the bottom of my top monitor to get caught on the camera. <laughs> ah, it's fine. Now, luckily, people aren't going to see this. They're just going to hopefully listen to it and learn something. I know, but it's also for my stream setup and all that. So <laughs> that's fair. Well, I think we've reached the halfway point now. And I think with that, we should move over to the most forbidden of topics, the most elusive of conversations, the long-awaited serial discussion. We don't have Jason here to stop us, and <laughs> we well know that I love serial. It's been talked about, but we haven't gotten into it or our favorites. And I'm glad to have Robin here for this, because Robin also is... A big fan of cereal. So we'll keep this nice and quick. Oh, so I've mentioned my spoon, my plus one spoon against cereal that came with its own special bowl. And that was a gift from Robin. (laughs) That is, the bowl isn't used often, I will admit. I'm afraid I'm going to damage it. But the spoon has seen combat and is quite efficient at slashing through grain-based enemies. I am a true cereal killer. The Captain Crunch of lunch. Thanks to my plus one weapon. So I'd like to ask you guys, um, all three of which are down south. You guys got cereal that I don't have access to. Yeah, like fruit brute? Heard of, yeah, fruit brute. Then we don't get that here. If I want to buy a box of fruit brute, it's, it's $27. It's a cherry cereal. Booberries. Don't have those. Boy, do I want to try them. They sound good. Um, and... Every once in a while, we'll get something that comes up like a cookie crisp, um, but they bastardize it and change it. It's not the same. I've had American <laughs> cookie crisp, but it is different. <laughs> so I, I, I'll pass this on to you guys. What's your favorite and why? Oops, all berries. I fucking fight me. <laughs> oops, all berries. Okay. Tell me about oops, all berries. So, you know, Captain Crunch, the Crunch berries, right? That's all um, it is. It's just the crunch it's berries. It's all the berries in oh, you the take Captain out the Crunch berries. Squares. Yeah, all the little squares are gone. It's just berries. <laughs> kind of like when they made tricks round, which was a catastrophe. Why'd you do that? Thank God they're fruit again. Tricks aren't round where you guys are. No, they're they fruit used again. To not be. They've always been round here. They were fruit, and then they made them balls, and that. That was an absolute atrocity and a curse among men. Okay. And here we are. Okay. They're they're all fruit again. They're fruit. Shapes. So they're wrong. They're wrong here. I'll just throw that out there. They are. I also, curse I also Canada. don't know. I don't think our our Captain Crunch has thingies in it. It's just Captain Crunch. Well, like Some the berries Captain are Crunch just just normal. Yeah, it's just like another yeah, like not, it's I, not. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh sorry. we did get last summer for Canada Day. We did get a limited edition red and white Captain Crunch that was the normal Captain Crunch with little berries. Yeah, those. That were, they were round. Those. The berries kind of are like round. miniature corn pops. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that was a limited edition thing we got for about a span of a month. I recently heard about strawberry frosted flakes. Yes! Oh, they're those strawberry are milkshake flavored frosted flakes. Yo, what the hell? Sign me up. We don't have that here. They're the best. So Look, I don't have a favorite cereal. I love Frosted Flakes, but the strawberry milkshake flavored ones were absolutely incredible. There's a box of stale ones in my closet because I bought too many boxes. <laughs> and then there's tricks. Only fruit shapes. Like, it has to be fruit shaped tricks or it's nothing. But then you have, like, the Halloween ones. So, Count Chocula, mm. top tier. Cocoa Puffs are okay, but every fall, you gotta get Count Chocula. 
Yeah, I don't think we get that up here. And there was a Cheerio that was banana nut Cheerios. And can I just tell you how freaking incredible those are? What's okay, your take I on Reese's I have seen Reese's those Puff? on the shelf, but I haven't tried them. <laughs> okay. Amazing. <laughs> What's right, your take so on Reese's Puffs? For that. Also, the strawberry milkshake frosted flakes turn your turn your milk into strawberry milk. Yes. So. And that is the superior flavored milk. Fight me. No, I, I agree. I'm not a big uh, <laughs> Nesquik or Reese Puffs guy myself. I'm not a big chocolate person when it comes to my cereal. A lot That's of my fair. favorites, even though I try everything that comes across, is I always have a box of Frosted Flakes in my house. I always have a box of Corn Pops in my house, even though they taste more like corn now than they ever did before. <laughs> the, my hot take is the best new cereal that I've encountered in recent years is they release Cinnamon Rice Krispies. And what? I don't know if you guys can get them down there. But I'm gonna look they are they are everything Rice Krispies should be. No no need to add anything. I make cereal bars with them. I don't I unsweetened as much as I can and they are just great. Uh, so keep your eyes out for the the cinnamon rice krispies. That being said, Canada has been going through, I don't know if you see it down there, a real maple and cinnamon phase for all of our limited edition cereals. Is that crossing the border? Yep. And pumpkin. I bought I some weird pumpkin here. cereal for the kids. I saw okay. a pumpkin spice Cheerio thing. Yeah, pumpkin spice. That's probably what it is. Okay. I don't look. Okay. It just says limited edition. I buy it and make the kids eat it. Nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that's much how I shop for my cereal. Oh, limited edition. I guess I better try it. Yeah. I've had some real flops. Don't buy the Jolly yep. Rancher cereal. It tastes like corn that's been blasted with Jolly Ranchers. It's bad. It's oh, real bad. That sounds really I, bad. I had hope that it was just going to be like apple and cherry and like watermelon, you know, nice and mild. But no, it was it was corn with Jolly Rancher powder on it. Bad, 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 bad. Could not eat it. Uh, I can also not eat the cinnamon toast Cinnabons. I found them to be really dry and just kind of blase. Too much cinnamon, not yeah, enough I didn't like enjoyment. Them I was about to say, Corey, if you're going to say you didn't like Cinnamon Toast Crunch, we were about to have problems. <laughs> oh, no, I like Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Don't get me wrong. I don't. I'll buy it. No? Too much sugar? I don't sugar? like cinnamon. No, I just don't like cinnamon. Rachel, we're having That's problems. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I could never not like cinnamon. Right? <laughs> so, what are your go-to cereals, me? Rachel? Oh, yeah. uh, I, I <clears throat> eat one type of cereal. It's a okay. cashew cereal with little blueberry clusters in it. If I ate sugar cereal, I would eat other cereals, but I don't usually buy those because, again, there are kids in this house, and then they would eat the sugar cereal, and, you know. Uh, I think the most important thing to me about cereal is that when you eat cereal, you need to, like, pour the milk on and immediately eat it. Like, there's... You can't let it sit at all. No, I hate stale cereal that, like... Get soggy. soggy. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Really gross. So I I almost thought for a second it was like you were going to say when you eat cereal, you gotta pour the milk first and then the cereal, and I was about <laughs> to be what Rachel. I, too. I was like, oh no. Pour the milk first, then cereal. <laughs> you Even psyched less me soggy. Out. <laughs> in fact, pour the milk in one bowl, cereal in another bowl. No, I don't do that. That's Just the kind of song. eccentricity that I could appreciate. I, uh, I'm i going to throw one of my roommates under the bus. He is <laughs> the worst for he will pour himself a bowl of Cheerios and leave it on the counter and go take a shower or like get changed and then eat them over the course of like 20 minutes. And it throws me off every time. And I'm glad that we've kind of we used to have our computers in the same room, so I'd witness this quite often. And I'm glad <laughs> now, now I've is. got my <laughs> own private space. Yeah, if you know, you know. Looking at you, Pyre. Damn it. None, none of my friends listen. Let's be honest. <laughs> Unless the ones that are here, in which case, thank you. I appreciate you very much. Jackson, what's your go-to cereal? What's the most cursed cereal you've had? The most, the most cursed, cursed cereal I've had? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Questions. Yeah. Well, the second one just came to me. It seems important. So my favorite cereal is is the Oops All Berries by Captain Crunch because I don't, full disclosure, I don't eat breakfast. 
the vast majority of the time. And whenever I do eat breakfast, it's very rare that I actually get cereal. So cereal is kind of a one time, once in a while treat for me. So I like going for all the sugary cereals. Frosted Flakes are awesome. Oops, all berries. Reese's Puffs, because why the hell not? It's a meme. <laughs> Cinnamon Toast Crunch is probably my favorite common cereal. Oops, all berries is actually fairly difficult to find. But I also have a least favorite cereal. There, there's one cereal in particular that I will never ever touch, and it's Kix, spelled K-I-X. Does it get soggy too quick? Yes, I, yes, yeah. exactly. No, it's the not even. The texture is awful. It's not even that they get soggy. It's just the taste. The, it tastes weird. It's like <laughs> soggy cardboard. Yes, with sugar. Yes, they're like it's okay. like sweet soggy cardboard balls. It's like. Th- the, I'm guessing it's the U.S. equivalent of Vector, which sounds very much the same. And yeah, it's it's not good. That being said, I know I listed a lot of really sugary cereals that I love, but I'm also a huge fan of. Give me some Shreddies. The they're just they're just good. You put a little honey on them, and away you go. If you want them sweeter, I also love Special K. Same. Or or Raisin Bran, or um, Oatmeal Crisp. They've come a long way. There's a there's a three berry Oatmeal Crisp now that is phenomenal. Um, the strawberry one's pretty good too, in both it and the Special K. Have you ever had Honey Bunches of Oats? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That may be who I'm thinking of instead of whichever one I just mentioned that has the three berry and the strawberry. I know that Special K also has them. So Special K also makes a cereal that is harder to find where I am, but it's Greek yogurt and berries. So it's got all the Special K grains and stuff in it and the little clusters, but then it's got like balls of like freeze dried Greek yogurt in it and like little freeze dried like strawberries and blueberries. And man... That's the that's the unsweet healthy cereal I'm going to put out there cuz it is so good. The Greek yogurt part is what really kicks it off. I, I get it. Does anybody else have childhood trauma from shredded wheat? The big squares. No. Not the big big squares. Oh, the big least... square that you had to break up? Yeah, that o- the older generation would quite often pour boiling water over, drain the water off and then add the milk in order to what? soften it. That's a thing. Ew! No, I ate those one time, and it was just like eating a bunch of Legos. Like, it hurt my mouth a lot. Yeah. You didn't boil it. (laughs) You didn't boil it first. That's just... You just go for oatmeal, then, instead of cereal. Yeah. Well... God. I'm glad I could hurt you all with my pain. This might just be a South thing, but have you ever had uh, grits? Yes! Fucking love grits! Grits is great. Look, so, I make cheesy grits all the time. Ooh. Anyway, don't look. Uh, breakfast is my favorite. You can't. We, it's very rare that I this. eat breakfast for breakfast. Um, yeah. Most of my cereal is eaten as a full meal, four <laughs> cups at a time. I won't lie. Cereal boxes yep. usually are like a three meal thing. And then I also do a thing. I don't know anybody else who does this. Um, maybe you guys can attest. I do what I call king bowls. And they're usually the result of after I go on a little cereal binge, you end up with, uh, you know, a couple of boxes that only have about a half bowl, third bowl left behind. So you pour them together. Yep. Does anybody else do this? I have not normally because if I see that there's like a half bowl left, I'll just eat half a bowl and then pour the rest. <laughs> I've okay, done that too. Fair. Yeah. Frosted just open flakes. up the new box of the same type. Pour I'll just... That's- Bring the That's other fair. box with me and eat half the bowl and then dump the other cereal in the milk that I just used and then eat the other cereal and then I'll sometimes give my dog the milk. My barbarism just outweighs yours by great levels. Recently I had a bowl of blueberry mini wheats with frosted flakes with a slight topping of Cheerios on top. Fantastic. Very good. <laughs> what kind of Cheerios? That's important. Just, just, just Good old Honey Nut Cheerios. Yeah! <laughs> we always have a box of it in the house. Uh, the roommate who lets his cereal get soggy is a big fan of them, so he always keeps them around. 
But we are uh, we are a serial household. We go through on average four to six boxes a week. Does oh, wow. does he also eat spaghettios out of the can? Like, is not he one that of those I've people? Witnessed. He might not as that well. I've witnessed. One can only hope not, because I do not know if a bigger sin could be committed in that adulthood. Wait, Robin, um, do unless you mean... you're camping. I will just leave. <laughs> do, do you mean cold? I have eaten my, I've I've eaten canned things out of the can with a fork or spoon. <laughs> Do you at least set it on the burner for a little bit to get warm first, or I don't know. Sometimes you get a little stony baloney and you just don't want to cook anything, so you just go open the can and grab okay. a fork. <laughs> that explains it. That explains it. <laughs> I guess my level of stony baloney just doesn't quite reach that. But it's I've also been known so to make I'm tacos at four in the morning. That's true. It's more so that I'm just hyper focused and I don't want to take the time to go do all of that effort. It's just time to eat. Yeah, I just want to get back to Baldur's Gate three. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Lunar and I keep trying to play it, but there's always something that gets in the way. <laughs> I gotta fight him. I've, I've broken. I think I'm over ninety hours now. Jeez. I'm still yeah, it's, in it, the little druid place at the very beginning. <laughs> yeah, enjoy, explore, have fun. I'm about to start again yeah. with different choices. But uh, any other final comments on cereal? This is a nice little 12 minute interlude that's going to get erased, I'm sure. But I'm glad <laughs> it happened. It could be released as lost content. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> we love you. Yep. Hold Cere- you real special in my heart, bud. Cereal's good. Love cereal. <laughs> yeah. And breakfast doesn't have to be for breakfast. No, not at all. Breakfast is any time right. you make it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and with that, a wonderful foray. I guess back on to more of our guided topic of improvisation and how I just forced you guys to talk about cereal for 13 minutes just with the mere suggestion of it. And I think that <laughs> says a lot for how you can guide your players in a way that can be enjoyable (laughs) and wild (laughs) yeah welcome to the show Jackson I do things a little different (laughs) so improvisation comes in a lot of different ways you can improvise the story you're telling or the character you're playing have any of you guys ever played a game where you were handed a sheet the moment you sat down Yes. and you had no forethought Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I, 90% of the games that are played at anime conventions are done. <laughs> perfect. Yeah, we don't we do not do those here as much. We've got some in, in Calgary, which I've only recently got access to, but I didn't hear about it until the last day of the conference was happening, so whoops. I've done it a few times and always get quite a kick out of playing a random character that's handed to me, because... I like to think whoever has generated it has a certain idea in their mind on how that character will be played. And I like to break that and change it. You play the doctor who lets himself get infected and then cuts off his hand and then disappears into the woods, but you're still playing that character. Or you're, you fall in love with somebody new that you play for five sessions and carry over into the future. It's just a fun aspect that can be interesting, I guess, is what I'm getting at. I've probably said interesting about a dozen times. Do you have any particular thoughts on handing characters to players? Do you find that you make those characters with the player in mind, or you make them with the idea of them just being an interesting character to play? I have not done this to my players. I've only experienced it as a player. Same. Yeah. Okay. And Unless... how did it make you feel? <laughs> Honestly, relieved. I felt relieved when I was handed the character sheet and I didn't have to make my character. Because then I got to read the character sheet and what its feats were and like, you know, all these sort of things. And then I made up my own backstory for this character. Just kind of on the fly, as you say, improv. So I like to read all of the feats that were taken, maybe the spells that were taken, you know, just all the aspects of the character and how it works. And then I just kind of come up with reasons why things work the way they do and just 
flush it out from there. And it's fun being given the sheet to just kind of... Well, the person who made this may have had an idea of how this character was going to be played, but this is how I'm interpreting this. And then it's just, I don't know, it's fun. I had to do less of the work and I get to do more of the fun part. <laughs> Super character fair. Character creation is the fun part. Yeah, no, it I absolutely mean, is. Just, I yeah. love character creation. But the backstory but, and the personality. Yeah, yeah, like sometimes... So... I retired recently a D&D character that I realized I'm probably never going to get to play again, but I had a 5e character that I loved a whole lot, and her name was Gala, and that was the only name she used, because she had a real name that she didn't go by. She named herself after apples, because they were her favorite, and she was a wild magic sorcerer. Well, I cross-faded that into Paladin, so she took three levels of Paladin and six levels of Sorcerer. And she was a monster. Originally, I started to build a glass cannon, and then I turned her into an unstoppable force of nature, and it was disgusting. But that campaign ended. But what it started off as is I made this character on the fly. It was a super quick character. I didn't have a backstory in mind. I was just like, this seems like a fun concept to play. I'm going to play it. And it was for a local game shop. So I wrote up her character sheet. I had zero idea what I wanted to do with her until I started playing her. And then it was like, I became this person and I sort of unloaded all of her backstory as we went along and created her as we played. And now she's got this entire whole and whole life that she had before. And then we started a new campaign where our DM nerfed those characters because some of us liked our characters a lot and we wanted to play a private game. So he invited us to his apartment where we took these characters that he kind of nerfed back and then we rebuilt to continue playing. And me and my best friend Joey, he was in that game also. And our characters had a backstory history. And we just kind of continued to build off of that. And that's probably one of the most in intricate characters I've ever made. And it was just kind of a okay, well, I'm going to jump into this session. I, I don't know how many sessions I'm going to play. And I just threw down a character that I didn't plan out and ended up fleshing out greatly. I couldn't stop thinking about it. It was very obsessive. But I, I don't think I've ever made characters for people, though. Yeah, I've never made characters for people. I have done the thing where I've handed them a blank character sheet and be like, all right, you have 20 minutes. <laughs> Give me something, and then we'll, we'll play a game. And sometimes that's enough. If it's like the person's like, I wanted to play a wizard, I'm like, okay, you get a little more time for spell picking. <laughs> yeah. But um, typically whenever I do that, though, it's, it's only for a one shot or like a short game or like, Hey, we, we all brought our D and D stuff with us. A few people couldn't show up, but we still have a few people here. Let's just bullshit a one shot and see how it goes. <laughs> but typically if, if it is like a, a longer campaign or something that requires a bit more planning on my end, the DMs end, uh, I'll give people fair warning and fair notice. Like there's a game I'm starting right now. It's going to be a runescape campaign for pathfinder. And I've, literally given my players three weeks notice to get things ready so <laughs> right on yeah i on the other hand have actually spent quite a lot of time giving people characters uh i've mentioned my own little world uh, multiple times that i run in today um and my primary group that i ran in it for over a year the duckward uh what i call the duckward tales group um throughout their adventures freed uh, a group of women from servitude and somehow through that this group of women became uh, a weird favorite of my players so what i did is i took each of these characters and i fleshed them out up to level five and one session when the guys loaded in i went hey guys you're going to be playing these characters today and handed them these women they had freed that were in a different part of the continent working on a completely different objective as a nice little kind of change of pace. The original group was a wizard, a bard, a fighter, and a ranger. 
where the second group, I gave him a Barbarian, I gave him an Arcanist. I made things very different and quite different from what they were playing and used it as a way kind of to break up the the monotony as well as giving myself more time to prepare the main event that I had been building towards with the primary characters. Over time, though that my group ended up playing as them several times at various levels um, within the same universe alongside their own characters working towards similar goals. And it turned out to be a really interesting experience that I would love to try again with a group down the road and see how different people handle the strangeness of showing up expecting one thing and going, actually, here you go. We're still in the same world, but you remember that person that you helped once upon a time? Well, you're them now. Enjoy. But I don't know if that always necessarily works the best for Pathfinder or Dungeons and Dragons. And that's why I love the beauty of systems like Kids on Bikes, mm. the Alien TTP, TTRPG system, um, me- Metal World, which I've mentioned a few times, and I, I will have to run you guys through a quick game. It'll only take us about an hour and a half to do one day. Um, because they're very easy, free-form, one-page systems. And I think a lot can be said for those alternatives, especially if you're doing one-shots. Have any of you guys ever used something like the Fate System or Gods Against the Apocalypse or Rules Against the Apocalypse? The Apocalypse System for a fantasy adventure in lieu of traditional Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder? I tried the Avatar tabletop role-playing game, which is it's empowered by the Apocalypse. That's what the system's written in, but I. Uh, it didn't go anywhere, partially because I just didn't understand the system. <laughs> That's fair. And how about yourselves? Nope. No? You stick uh, pretty true? Well, I do D&D and Pathfinder, but I, I mean, I've done a fair amount of... We're playing D&D, but mostly we're just doing whatever we want and making up the rules, because bullshitting is my favorite part of everything. Yeah, ain't nothing we'll, wrong we'll with that. We'll go with everything, yeah. Yeah, hey, right on. What about... I played a ton of different things that aren't D&D or Pathfinder, but similar. So we've played in Monster of the Week together. I even ran one for you. And like some of our other friends, that was fun, except for you essentially summoned an Elder God and ended the universe or world or... You know, sometimes crazy just, fishermen do crazy fisherman things. Yeah, totally, totally. No, what, it was wait, absolutely. Hold on. That's not a crazy <laughs> fisherman thing. That's oh. Cthulhu. <laughs> his backstory was that his wife had been taken by the Loch Ness monster within the Bermuda Triangle, so he had bought a fishing trawler and was out hunting cryptids with it. Yeah, he walked around with a chain, uh, a trident that on one end had he had modified so a chainsaw was attached. He was a crazy fisherman. It's the only way to describe. Basically, him. what happened is this man had a lot of trauma. He was summoned as a professional in his genuine like work field to investigate paranormal activity in the Bermuda Triangle because there were people were experiencing lots of weird things there. So everyone's character in this Monster of the Week campaign was essentially a crazy person but a completely obsessive like super successful person in their field of study um some people were scientists he was a fisherman slash hunter like and things like that so but everyone because i was running monster of the week set in you know lovecraftian lore the more weird things people experienced and the more bad roles they made the more tally marks they got towards their insanity. So they began to hallucinate things and see things that weren't there and experience flashbacks and things. And so this man thought that he was going to hunt down the Loch Ness monster in the Bermuda Triangle and like summoned Cthulhu, essentially. Yeah, (laughs) Um, but that's the kind of chaos that happens when you have myself and the one and only Alex Giordano playing side by side. And we both designed our characters without talking to each other at all and both brought lunatics to the table. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I can't remember my character's name, but I know that I had a list of about 200 phrases that fishermen may say about the sea. <laughs> and he essentially only talked in proverbs and fishermen's rhymes. Yeah. So you take that and then Alex played, I believe he was a doctor of some variety. He was an insane person in because he was an insane person. He was, he, Alex was like, can I play against the party? Because now that we're sitting here and I can tell you all of these things, Alex was like, do you mind if I play against the party? Like, I want to be a bad guy. I want to convince the party to summon bad things. And I was like, yeah, go for it. Just try not to make it obvious. And he was like, okay. This motherfucker brings a character. Can I say that? Can we say bad words? I didn't yeah. even... I mean, I've, yeah. I've dropped it. <laughs> anyway, <in so. laughs> he brings this character who's a mad scientist who's crazy and evil, who stole the personality. Like, well, he stole this person's entire life basically like impersonated them so he received the letter that was meant for the person whose life he essentially pilfered from them and like came on this cruise what happened to the actual doctor that was supposed to be there who knows probably murder <laughs> it's not important right but now. alex yeah, alex was a cultist stuff. Al Alex was a cultist, a Lovecraftian cultist, who was impersonating this guy, and that's essentially what happened, is he, he was trying to help encourage weird things to happen, and encourage the party to do, like, crazy stuff. So he was playing against you guys the whole time. That doesn't surprise me, and my guy would never notice. It, it was a very Alex thing to do. Yeah, so I think that kind of brings us to the moral of the story for this uh, this mutiny, and that's live Trust on your feet. No it's just a game. Beware playing with Alex because he makes crazy people that'll come against you, and <laughs> defeat your enemies in the form of grains with swiftness and righteousness. Devour them between the maw of your own hunger and teach them who's boss. And... <laughs> Remember to have a good time out there. Don't take everything too serious. Any final thoughts from Jackson or Rachel before we wrap this one up? I've got my spoon ready. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Is it a plus one spoon? Uh, no, it's a minus one spoon, actually. <laughs> Shit. Otherwise known as a fork. Might as well be using a, a, a wooden spoon at that point. Enjoy your mouth slivers. <laughs> or a spork. Sporks are surprisingly painful to eat cereal with. Sporks uh, I, are superior, though. I spent a period of my life where I used, like, a camping fork spoon set that, like, slid together and they folded for every meal I ate. Uh, so I can't say much because it was definitely, like, one of those forks or a fork spoon that also had, like, a serrated butter knife edge on it. Yeah! And I love that thing. <laughs> and then the other one was, like, a fold-out butter knife or something like that. I can't even remember. But I used that bad boy for every meal for a solid three to six months. <laughs> Litter has a goddamn switch fork, and it's the funniest thing ever. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I, I, uh, I've i got a spring, spring blade comb that I'm quite a fan of, because it definitely looks like it's the knife until you hit the button and it's comb. Uh, the problem is it's poorly made and rips my hair out, Ooh. so better not to use it. No, so it is a weapon. No. It, I guess it is. It's it's so sturdy. Scalp your enemies. It is a sturdy blade. You could hurt somebody with it, honestly. But that is a topic for another time. Uh, injuring people with objects not made for it. <laughs> Next mutiny Robin. improvised weapons. Yeah, and, <laughs> yes! and their various <laughs> uses it. in TTRPG campaigns. Uh, that would give me a wonderful chance to talk about Suki, my Starfinder character who only ever attacked by... Uh, launching uh, one of the dozens of flashlights they carried on their body with telekinetic projectile. They were blind, so it was weird they carried flashlights. Uh, Suki broke my heart when they died. They got radiation sickness and passed after losing all their fur. Flock in love. <laughs> Core, your character concepts are so fucking wild, I love them. <laughs> yeah, I go weird places with them. 
We can do weird it's, characters next. Yeah, yeah but you know and, what? This man has like hundreds of characters already pre-made to pop into back, like as backup. So. I don't it's, doubt it. <laughs> it's true. I always have something on the back burner. And with some of the new Playfinder playtest uh, stuff that just came out recently here, uh, with the announcement of the Exemplar and whatever the other class is, I can't remember. Animus. 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 The Animist. Animus. We may finally see the character concept I have had since I started getting into D&D come to life, thanks to the Animist. So we'll see. The goal is that I am going to keep Zaba alive as long as possible, but uh, we may finally see the rise of Helgreth the Unsullied. Uh-oh. Thanks to the arrival of the Animist. So that's Boy. something I'm very excited for. Spoilers. <laughs> yeah, it's, he'll exist in one form or another. You just got to watch out. Maybe we'll do something for Halloween. Get a little spooky. He will show up and he will find yes. you. Yeah. Oh, he is everywhere and nowhere. The wind. Robin, do you want to plug yourself a little bit? What you're doing over at TRT? Give us a little uh, segue on what you're doing in case anybody's not familiar. Sure. Why not? I play Stella in the Roaring Trainers podcast. We're on campaign two. Actually, we're getting... I think we just finished arc three or arc four. I don't even know anymore. Like, who counts? Uh, we just do really fun stuff. We play D&D in the form of Kanto and the Jazz Age. So, yeah. It's lots yeah, it's of fun. Po- we... It's Pokemon. Yep, we play Pokemon. So, yeah, if you're looking for something fun and... Definitely improv and roleplay driven, in my opinion. Very. Go check out the Roaring Trainers. They're great, and they're the OGs when it comes to the the Pokemon podcast world. So they're worth a listen. And any other notes, or we get to wrap this one up, folks? Good. Thanks for joining us. I think we're good. Yeah, thanks for All having right. me on short notice. Yeah, thank you, yeah, for thank you everybody, for listening. And may your party never end.